Man, you build me up. People might be let down now. Gee. Oh, yeah, if the kids want to go out for kids' church. Well, welcome to Sunday Church. I suppose the background to um, me being here is a couple of weeks ago on a Friday, Friday week ago, Alan sent me a text and I was actually at work and his text said, oh, I'm going to be away for the next couple of weeks. Would you be happy to share and preach? And, you know, I was sort of busy at work and my first response was, oh, you know, this is without warning. And so my brilliant text back to him was, I'll think about it. <laughs> and I suppose in my headspace at that time, it was like, that gives me an out. You know, I haven't said yes, I haven't said no. Um, and then my head started doing miles and miles, um, arguments in my own head. You know, do I have time to do this? Really, am I ready to be standing out the front preaching? Do I have a topic? Surely it's not me. There's got to be someone else that's better than me. <laughs> and um, But then I also heard other voices from God and from words from the Bible about being strong and courageous, not leaning on your own understanding, um, not leaning on your own strength, and also a challenge of where is my example of submitting to God and his will and not my own, and not my own desires. Um, so yeah, I still, over that next week, was praying about it. God had given me a a few topics that I was thinking, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe this. Uh, and Alan wanted to know by last Sunday. And in my heart of hearts, I was like, okay, when I see Alan, he's going to come to me and he's going to go, look, you know, a couple of other people came through and we don't need you. So <laughs> put it on hold. But he didn't do that. And he said, you're still good to go. And I thought, hang on, I didn't say yes. But <laughs> so I did say yes. And so here we are today. So my topic today is responding to God's calling. Um, it's been a journey and a challenge to myself throughout my life and particularly over the last 11 months of, of coming here to this church and especially with Alan's talk about being a disciple for Jesus. So before we start, I'm just going to open in prayer as well. Dear Lord Jesus, we just thank you that you love us, that you died on the cross and that you rose again, that you have a plan for our lives, that you have a plan for us even here today. And I know on my own there is, I've got nothing. Um, you know, it's, it's not got to be my words today, Lord. It's got to be you speaking your words uh, through me. So I just pray that you would, like you've said, you'll be with us through all times I just pray that you'll speak through me that you would bring your Holy Spirit upon me that you would uh, open my eyes and my ears to hear what you're saying and also everyone else here Lord we pray that you would just quieten everyone's hearts that you would open their eyes and ears to hear what you would say not from what I say but what you would say through what I might say today Lord that you would make it relevant to each individual person and that today uh, we'll have a fresh anointing of what you say and that we won't just be hearers of what we hear, but we will be doers, Lord. And we just pray this in your name. If you've got a Bible, um, and it'll be up here hopefully, we're able to get uh, the Bible verses up there. So if you turn to Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Basically, the background to this is we're following on from the Israelites who were persecuted in Egypt and were held captive there, and they've left Egypt, and uh, they're on their way to the Promised Land. And if we turn to chapter thir uh, uh, yeah, Numbers 13, verses 1 and 2. So the Lord said to Moses, Send men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to all of the Israelites. 
from each ancestral tribe send one of its leaders. So where they're at at the moment is Kadesh. And uh, so obviously Moses goes and selects and we won't go through all of who he selects. And basically those 12 go out and they go into the land of Canaan. And if we skip through to um, verses 27, they've come back to give Moses a report. And I need to get my glasses, sorry. <laughs> See, they probably didn't need glasses to see what they saw. Okay, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Gev, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they are spread. And then they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there were of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak who had come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. And over into chapter 14. That night all of the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the desert. Why is the Lord bringing us out to the land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives, our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. I suppose when we look at that from outsiders, we just go, okay, wow. You know, here is God before you through Moses telling you you're ready to go into the land and you guys are hesitating. And we turn to verses 26 to 30 and we see God's response to this. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. In this desert your bodies will fall. Every one of the 20 years old or more who have counted on the census and who have grumbled against me. No one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home except Caleb the son of Jephana and Joshua son of Nun. It wasn't God's will for this to occur, for them to wander in the wilderness, but they chose to refuse to obey what he commanded them to do. Again, we look back and we can see all of what they'd been through. They'd gone through all of the plagues. They had saw God's mighty hand in Egypt. They had saw the release, and on their walk, they saw passing through the Red Sea where God held out the water so they could pass, and all of the Egyptians perish that had chased them. They were delivered with quail and manna, the pillar of cloud by day and a fire of night. If you read through the passages, um, roughly it took them two years to leave Egypt and get to Kadesh. And now they're going to wander for 38 years in the wilderness because they chose not to follow through with what God had commanded and asked them to do. I'm wondering, are you wandering in a wilderness today? Have you responded to God's call on your life? And not just saying, I will follow you, but then going through and actually doing what he's asking you to do. Or are you delaying? 
delaying what he's asking you to do? Or are you delaying what he may be asking you to stop doing? The challenges we sometimes face and the direction God wants us to go may seem overwhelming at times. But are we relying on our own strength? Or are we relying on God's strength and his strong hand? Obviously the story doesn't end there. Let's skip through to Joshua, the beginning of Joshua, chapter 1, 5 to 9. So basically what God has done, Moses has just died and God has commanded Joshua to lead the Israelites. So as we turn to verse 5, the Lord has said to Joshua, No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers and to give them. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all of the law my servant Moses gave you and do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful. So as we see there, follow the books of the law and do what you think is right. Is that what it says? Is that what we read when we read the Bible and we read uh, Jesus' example of what it looks like to follow him? How many of us read these challenges and then we refuse to apply it to our lives? It's easy for us to hear it on a Sunday and we go home and we get busy and we think about it maybe for Sunday and then sometimes Monday comes and the week starts and our busy lives continue and we set it aside. As it says here, the commandment to Moses was, or not to Moses, to Joshua was, you will prosper but you need to not turn to the left and not turn to the right. You need to follow the words written in here. You need to meditate it on it day and night. And you'd think maybe that would be easier for those people, and for a time they did do that as well. I mean, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have Netflix, they didn't have TV, they didn't have um, some of the distractions, I suppose, we have today. And how much do we meditate on the words of Jesus? I know for me at times I struggle. I fill my time with other things. I go to work. I get busy. I just want to relax. So sometimes I watch TV, things that I don't even care that I'm watching, but I'm watching because I'm filling time. And then I get later in the night, and uh, I know over this past year of probably 85% of the time I've got a Bible app, and I've been reading through the Bible in 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 the year and I haven't got through it in the year so I'm a bit behind where I should be but um, you know at the end of the day sometimes I'm going and God still speaks to me through that but I go am I actually giving him the time that he deserves or desires well let's move on we know plenty happens throughout the Bible and to the Israelites and there's times that they do follow Jesus Oh, well, not Jesus. They follow God and they follow the laws. And there's kings that come and go. And some kings follow the teachings and some people don't. But it gets to the point that they totally turn their back on God. They uh, intermarry into other cultures, which they were told not to do. And those other cultures have other religions. Before long, they become corrupted so much in the things that they do that God decides he's had enough and he hands them over to their enemies, the Babylonians, which were considered some of the fiercest people in those times. Let's turn to Jeremiah to see again what happens with God and his teachings. So the Israelites are captured and Jeremiah is God's prophet to speak to the Israelites in those times. Jeremiah says to them that you will now be in captivity for 70 years. However, there's another false prophet, Hananiah, that comes into the scene at that time. 
And he starts talking to the Israelites and says, look, that's, that's not happening. Yes, we are captured, but it's only going to last for two years. It's not 70 years, it's two years. And the people started to warm to Hananiah. Hananiah was telling the people what they wanted to hear, and his teachings wasn't from God at all. How often do we sometimes search for an answer? And when we hear the answer that we don't want to hear, we keep turning to somebody else or something else until we hear the answer that we want to hear so we can go ahead with what we justify that we think is our perfect plan. Let's turn to Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. These verses are probably one of the most common verses that are quoted as a blessing for people. I don't know at the moment in your life if you feel like you're in captivity or if you feel afflicted by the circumstances of what's happening. But we know that what it says here for these Israelites, they had to pray to God and they had to seek him with all of their hearts. Are we doing that? You know, for them, their prayers of being released, it was going to take 70 years for those prayers to be answered. Most of the time, we're praying to God and hoping that he answers our prayers in a week. Our response to this should be that we pray through all things. Ultimately, it is about God's will in our lives and not our own if we're going to be completely surrendered to him and his will. It's not always easy when you might be suffering either physically, emotionally or mentally. And we know it's not always easy to see God's plans through things or why he allows things to happen. I know through my own personal experience when I was 25 years of age, um, I was working in mental health nursing uh, and one day I'd spoken to a client and that seemed to go okay and as I walked away I felt this excessive pain across the back of my head. He had fully king hit me, I landed on the ground, while I was on the ground he was attempting to stomp on my head and my neck till I was able to push him away. When I got up he had given me an uppercut and had his fingers in my eyes trying to gouge my eyes out. Eventually I was able to restrain him, in restraining him I hit him in the face and splattered his blood all over my face. Um, eventually another nurse came to help and I had restrained the patient on the ground and in her trying to help she also got punched in the face and had her jaw broken. I had a short period off work with post-traumatic stress as you could understand at that time. Lachlan was around 10 months old. After a few weeks I forced myself back to go to work. I was struggling to cope and was in denial that I'd started to develop depression. And I couldn't believe that this could be happening to me. I was a male, one, two, I was a psych nurse, I wasn't a patient. Three, I was a husband, I was a father. This wasn't going to be my story and how could this be God's plan in my life? After all, I was ticking the boxes that I thought I needed to tick. I was going to church, I was reading his word, maybe not every day, but I was also praying to him every day. I lied to my therapist and said all was good and refused to consider any medication as I wasn't depressed because God was going to work it all out and it was all going to be fine. But I knew I was spiralling down, but I wasn't going to reveal that to others and I kept a mask on until one day again at work I felt the pain across the back of my head. Another patient had thrown a porcelain cup and hit me in the back of the head. 
I responded in a fight or flight response and went over to this patient, picked him up by the throat with one hand and started to strangle him for a few seconds. I realised what I was doing and left there and went into the nurse's station shaking and tearful, informing them that I quit, that I couldn't keep up the act. I was placed on work cover and saw a doctor and he commenced antidepressants and I saw a counsellor. I felt embarrassed and like a failure. Was this God's grand plan for my life? A little bit of time went on and my meds were increased to the highest level that they could do, um, but that was with minimal improvement, but at least it had minimal side effects. So an extra medication was added to assist. The following morning, once I'd taken that medication, it hit me so hard that I couldn't walk. I had to crawl my way to the toilet and around the house for the beginning of that day and I couldn't talk. I could see the look on my wife's face as she watched her husband. And my thoughts at that time was if this was it, I couldn't even defend my family if I needed to. And I prayed to God that he would take my life. I saw no way out for those first few days and I thought I was only an extra burden. And my wife had also given birth six months ago to our second child. Throughout those times, I remember glimpses of colour through seeing birds or insects, being reminded that God cares for them even more. And so I shouldn't worry. I didn't have the energy to worry. But through all of those things, I still knew that God was real and his spirit was with me even in those dark days. God was challenged me back then and since then. What does it mean to fully surrender? to his purpose, his plan, and what does it mean to live as a Christian disciple? Is it on my terms or is it on his terms? Let's look quickly at his terms. If we turn to Luke chapter 14, verses 26 to 33. Again, you've heard these from Alan in the, over the last few months. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his mother and father, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And if anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower, will he not first down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he starts the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow he began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able, with 10,000 men, go against someone with 20,000 men? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. He is asking us to carry our cross. And when we talk about carrying the cross, we're talking about a symbol of death. We're not actually talking about what a lot of people believe is carrying the cross was my depression at that time. That wasn't necessarily my cross at all. We've got to remember, I suppose, the cross in that day was a symbol of death. People would die on it. And what it means by carrying your cross is that you actually are dead to yourself. That what you want, your plans, your desires for your life is dead and that you are fully surrendered. And when we have that superior surrender to following Jesus and laying down of everything, it's only then that our love for anyone else. So if Jesus isn't actually saying you have to hate everyone else. He's saying when you fully surrender everything to me and are willing to follow everything that I want you to do, your love for your family and your friends and your children and your parents will actually look like hate. So what might this look in practice? Consider the story of John Bunyan. You may have heard of him. Probably not because it wasn't in recent times. In 1650 he was lived in England. 
He was in prison for 12 years. He was in prison for preaching. That was his crime. He stated the worst punishment was being separated from his wife and his four children, one of which was only two months old at that time. And I quote, he said, Parting hath oft been to me in this place as pulling the flesh from my bones. He tried to support his family by making shoelaces while he was in prison, but he relied on the charity and good work of others to help support his family and their well-being. Bunyan could have easily freed himself, but he chose not to. And how he could have freed himself, he had to promise that he would never preach again. He told the local magistrate that he would rather remain in prison until moss grew on his eyelids than fail to do what God commanded. What a challenge to us. Are we truly willing to die to our own will every day, not just for today, not just for Sunday, not just for the times that we choose to? And are we fully to fully surrender, as Paul states in Galatians 2.20, He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Sometimes we might contemplate when we hear God asking us to do something, do we do it or do we not do it? Or if he's asking us not to do something, do we do that or not or do we delay There's nothing wrong with talking to Jesus about that and coming to that place and wrestling with him as to what does he really want. We know Jesus did that in Gethsemane. Uh, he sweated blood knowing what was going to take place but then fully surrendered to what God wanted him to do. Are we willing and am I willing to be dead to my self-centered planning? If so, then Christ determines our priorities then we surrender where we live, what we have, our employment, the places we go and the plans that we make. He would determine everything. We may have given him the things so far in our life that we're comfortable to give him. But what about the things we're not comfortable to give him? If it is all yours, Lord, for what do you want and for what is your purpose then this changes everything that we do it changes our possessions and how we hold on to them in today's world we are inundated with stuff the newer the more the better is our catch cry that we hear from society but Paul in his letter to the Romans in chapter 12 2 says do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Do we choose to follow Jesus with a superior love? More than for anyone else, more than for our family, more than for our desires or for any other person. Let's just turn over to Hebrews, what this may or has looked like in the past. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God, rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. Moses chose a superior love to follow his God than to follow what he could have had if he stayed with Egypt. Are you or I looking at the reward we may have here on earth with our own desires 
oh, are we going to decide? Because that's it, it's a decision. Are we going to decide to be fully committed to die to our own desires? We think our plans might be good in relation to families, cars, possessions, but do we stop to think of what God's really offering us? There will always be issues, heartache, depression, poverty, sickness, and even death. As we look across the landscape of Christianity, we know of friends and individuals who have blamed God for things that have gone wrong according to their plans, and they've missed the opportunity to remain fully surrendered to God's plans, no matter what the outcome. It's like we read back there in Luke about starting to build a building and not being weighing up the cost of are you going to be able to complete the building and how do you complete the building? Well, again, it's only through full surrender to God. God is never to blame for what we go through. But he will use our circumstances to mould us into the people and the design that he would have us to be, especially if we surrender to him as Lord of all. We may not hear our prayers answered here on earth or in our timing or even in the way we wish. And we may not find the answers until we get to heaven. But God has his plan and it is only through complete surrender and relying on his sovereign will and his strength and his enabling that we will see God fulfilling his will in our lives. What is God saying to you today and to me? I know he's challenged me not just to be a hearer of the word, but to be a doer, as recorded in James. Am I surrendering? Am I willing to put things into action? Am I going to endeavour through his power and to his strength to die to myself? And when I do choose the other way, to turn straight away back to him, not to, to turn from that and to keep walking the other way like in detox that's one of the things they say don't let a lapse become a relapse don't let one sin develop into another sin to harden your hearts and to walk away from god when you know what the truth is you know where he's been through through your life and he will continue to be there it's not like he's left you through whatever you're going through we're going to close with a song I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> and Daniel doesn't have to think, uh, sing this one either. We, we're giving you guys a reprieve. But it's the song which is, the word, well, the, the, it's called Even If. It's written by Bart Millard from Mercy Me. Hopefully we can get this up on the screen um, and we'll play that. So if we just have a listen and watch. Well, that's the end. I was going to say that's all folks. <laughs> but it's really not all folks. It's, um, for me, it's over to me as to what I do with what I've heard and what I've prepared. And it's over to you what you do. If God has spoken to you, I don't know what he said to you. Maybe he said a lot of things. Maybe he hasn't said much. Um, let's just close in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the examples of different individuals throughout the Bible and particularly through your son of what he is willing to go through and suffer to the point of the cross and then died and rose on our behalf to make a way to you. We pray that uh, what we've heard today, that you will do what you say you will do in the Bible, that you say you will cut through to our heart that you will speak to us Lord we pray that we won't be just hearers of what we hear but we will actually be doers and we will put things into practice of what we know we need to put into practice to draw us closer to you and to follow you and truly be your disciple so we pray that throughout today and as we go forward to the week that uh, we will listen to you Lord that we'll be open to your leading, that you will open doors and close doors, even the doors that we may want open, Lord, that if you want to close them, that you will close them and you will open up other doors. 
And if there's times that we refuse to follow you, Lord, that you will gently guide us and direct us back to you, that we won't surrender to the devil that wants to trap us and ensnare us and will do anything he can to put doubts and give us dismay and cause us to blame you for the errors and the failures in our life, Lord. We pray that we will endeavour to be fully surrendered to you, to your will in our lives, Lord. And we pray this in your name. Amen.